Hey, what's up everybody? Sean here and sorry for coming in late. Been trying to work through a, a few technical uh, difficulties, but uh, we're here and it is 1.35 and we're going to kick this off. I'm going to wait for a few people to come in. If you're catching this on the replay, uh, thank you. I want to appreciate, you know, I just want to say how much I appreciate you coming in and, and kind of following up and wanting to see more of the content that we're we're putting out there. Um, uh, this is my weekly broadcast. Uh, I haven't been great about doing it weekly. Um, but uh, if you've been following uh, me for any length of time, you know uh, kind of what's going on. Working very closely with my physician advisor right now to get uh, the Epic Review course uh, approved. And uh, we are just about ready to submit that to the Board of Critical Care for uh, review and approval. So super excited about that. Um, as I mentioned in an earlier broadcast today, uh, I'm going to go over uh, some some tips and tricks about uh, BiPAP uh, ventilation, non-invasive ventilation uh, using bi-level uh, airway pressures. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the problems you may run into when you start um, trying to put a pediatric patient on the ventilator. Uh, I'm also going to answer your, uh, answer some questions. I've been getting a lot of questions um, uh, in the in the past several weeks about um, uh, pediatric ventilation, and that's kind of what prompted this particular topic. But we're going to go through some of the other questions that I've gotten from new members who have been joining the uh, joining the group, and see if I can answer some of their questions. So. I'm just going to give this a few more minutes uh, for people to come in, and uh, I'm going to spool up a couple things that I uh, want to reference for you guys that will help you out. If you have any questions during the broadcast, you can always post them in the comments section. I will see those and I will do what I can to answer your question the best I can. Uh, All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so first things first is I like to do is I like to get started by answering some questions. So let me go here. Uh, let me go ahead and scroll through some of the questions that we've gotten in the past week. Um, ventilator settings and ABGs. Okay, we're going to go over ventilator settings um, a little bit today, specifically how it applies to um, uh, BiPAP patients or patients that we want to trial on non-invasive. And there's a component of blood gases uh, with that, so we're going to try and cover some of that. Uh, balloon pumps, that's kind of a big topic that we're not going to cover uh, today, but we will try to cover that in a, in a future broadcast that I can kind of plan for a little bit more. Independent ventilator management strategies, again, we're going to go over that today. Trauma management within a HEMS setting. Um, that's kind of a vague, kind of broad topic. Um, Trauma management in the HEM setting. I mean, I think, you know, like in any other setting, right, we know that patients who uh, sustain a traumatic injury, they they do best when they can get to definitive care quickly. Um, there's this big push for uh, stop the bleed, and we know that those patients um, do better when we can do aggressive hemorrhage control and then uh, rapid transport. That's really what we can do. And it doesn't really change uh, much in the HEMS environment either. Uh, it's still uh, aggressive uh, hemorrhage control, 
airway management, you know, ABCs, um, and rapid transport. Um, we're still doing all the same procedures. We're still applying, applying tourniquets. We're still applying um, pelvic binders, still doing traction splints if necessary. Um, I think the only real difference in the HEMS environment, um, and I think it's becoming more and more um, utilized in the ground transport environment, is the use of um, uh, anti uh, Antithrombolytics, so things like TXA to prevent the um, the clot breakdown. We're starting to see that more uh, and more. Um, when it comes to fluid resuscitation, there's a number of studies out there, and I'd have to look them up to be able to cite specifically the studies. But it's pretty definitive now that we should really be resuscitating our trauma patients with blood products. That's that's kind of a problem um, in the ground transport environment, um, just because most agencies aren't approving their their pre-hospital providers to administer to start blood products. There are some aggressive services out there that are, and to them, uh, I commend you. Um, that's fantastic. There's even a lot of um, uh, flight programs that are not carrying blood, and I hope to see that change uh, over the uh, over the course of the next uh, year year or so. Um, there's this uh, uh, kind of idea in um, uh, fluid resuscitation for the trauma patient that we should be giving a lots of uh, the yellow stuff, so plasma, platelets, and cryo precipitate first. Okay, um, and then start transitioning to these uh, pack red cells. And the studies are uh, pretty good um, that patients who receive um, plasma platelets and cryo uh, early uh, do very well, um, and then transitioning into the red blood cells. Um, you know, there's there's uh, uh, massive transfusion protocol which varies depending on where you are in the country. Some say one to one to one. Some say uh, two to one to one, but basically what that is, is you're trying to replace, uh, you're trying to match um, whole, uh, whole blood components. So red cells, plasma, and platelets. And that's what that is. Um, that's how many units of red cells you give compared to how many units of plasma you give compared to how many units of platelets you give. Um, and trying to basically replicate uh, whole blood transfusion. So that's what's going on in, in trauma management uh, in the HEMS environment. I think we're starting to see more programs move towards um, fluid resuscitation with blood products, and I think that that's going to continue. In the future, um, there is, I, I guarantee we're going to start seeing um, freeze-dried plasma show up on our, uh, our, on our ambulances and on our aircraft. I know that the FDA recently approved um, freeze-dried plasma for use in the military, uh, and, and they kind of fast tracked that approval. So I think that we're going to see that start to kind of make its way back into the civilian world. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, what else do we have here? I'm just kind of scrolling through my, uh, uh, my pictures here of questions that I've received. Um, non-invasive, uh, ventilation. We're going to go over that here in just a little bit. Um, Labs. <clears throat> there was a question that I received just today about um, blood gases. And uh, it had to do with lots of questions about blood gases, um, specifically related to sodium and potassium and um, uh, SVR. And it was kind of a, uh, kind of a confusing question because uh, I don't really know exactly if these were three different questions or if this was all one. Um, but um, I just wanted to give you a quick resource. If, if you're one of those people who struggles with um, blood gas interpretation, um, there's a really great resource. Uh, it's called ABG Ninja. Maybe you've already uh, seen this. Maybe you've used this quite a bit, uh, but I myself, uh, only recently was introduced to this. Um, and basically what it does is it just scrolls through. Uh, you're presented with a, um, uh, a blood gas. It's got a pH, PCO2, and bicarb. And you are supposed to go through and choose what's their primary problem. Uh, are they com uh, is it compensated? And then how much uh, compensation? So is it metabolic, respiratory acidosis, or alkalosis? Um, and then is there um, metabolic or respiratory um, compensation? 
And then, um, is it fully or partial? Uh, it's great for just running through repeated blood gases to kind of get you dialed in um, to uh, reading those and being able to quickly interpret, uh, interpret those. Okay, so here's what I really wanted to dive in today. So we're going to start off with BiPAP. And I did a podcast, or I did a blog post about this, um, um, oh gosh, several years ago. Uh, that I'll link to in the comment section here um, that you can find. Um, but it's basically de deciding CPAP versus BiPAP and how do you know which one to use? What's the difference between the two? Um, and <clears throat> when you start making um, titrations to uh, the BiPAP, how do you go about doing that? Whoa. You know, um, I I've been uh, guilty of doing this myself. Um, just kind of willy-nilly making modifications to the settings and hoping that uh, it's going to improve the patient. Um, I did that a lot when I was just for when I was first learning ventilator management. And uh, now that I've been doing this quite a while, I've been working with clinicians uh, like Melissa Versman, who I had um, on the uh, on the show or in one of the broadcasts uh, not too long ago. Um, you know, she kind of really opened my eyes. Um, and just kind of reinforce some of the ideas that I had already uh, kind of known to be true. And then uh, there was another podcast that I re recently listened to from the guys over at Rebel EM that, again, just kind of reinforced this idea um, about uh, how we should approach our patients that we're going to be managing with non-invasive non ventilation. Um, and so... Um, Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to find find this uh, link here so you can uh, you can have it. Anyways, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the comment section once I find it. But um, so here's what you here's what I want you to think about when you're approaching a patient um, with um, who's in respiratory distress. Okay, um, in in the the uh, Rebel EM uh, podcast, they talk about the rule of twos. Okay, and this is it's not my uh, my uh, my rule. Um, I didn't make that up. Um, this comes from those guys. Um, but there's really two types of um, respiratory uh, or uh, respiratory failure, if you will. There's uh, a type one respiratory failure, which is a hypoxic respiratory failure, meaning um, their O2 stats are low. And there is a type two respiratory failure, which is a, a failure of ventilation. Okay. We talk about oxygenation and ventilation. Oxygenation meaning getting oxygen down in the alveoli and getting it across that alveolar capillary membrane and into the tissues to perfuse organs. Ventilatory uh, failure being the failure to off gas or to um, get rid of excess CO2. Now, rarely do we have a patient who is a isolated um, ventilatory failure. Okay, usually there's some kind of um, type one uh, failure, uh, oxygenation problem uh, as well. Um, but we're going to talk about these individually so that you can kind of really get a grasp on um, what it is we talk about when when we're talking about type one failure, type two failure, and whether or not we're going to use BiPAP versus CPAP. Okay, so. The rule of twos, there's two types of failure, uh, oxygenation failure, type one, ventilation failure, type two. Okay, so let's start with type one. Type one, um, type one ventilation, uh, type one failure is oxygenation failure, right? The, the patient is unable to uh, on get or take on oxygen, oxygen, okay? And the way we correct this, well, there's really only two ways we can correct this, okay? Let me go ahead and see if I can um, share this real fast and uh, see if this will make sense. Uh, do, 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 do. Can I share? I can't share. Okay, well, just kind of think through this with me, okay? Um, this kind of be like a, a thought game. So um, there's two ways that we can correct an oxygenation problem. One, we can increase the FiO2, right? That's easy. You increase the FiO2, the concentration of oxygen, then the partial pressure of oxygen goes up. Remember, um, what is it? Um, it's um, Dalton's law. I believe it's Dalton's law, the law of partial pressures, that the sum of uh, a pressure is equal to the, uh, or a, a pressure of a gas is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of its components, right? And we know that air is oxygen and nitrogen, a little bit of other stuff. If we increase the concentration of oxygen in the air around us to 100%, then 100% of whatever pressure uh, 
that is, is coming from oxygen. And so oxygen will want to diffuse across that pressure gradient, or that concentration gradient. Okay. And we know that the blood coming back to the lungs is low in oxygen. So we are basically increasing the gradient um, within the alveoli from, um, from, you know, still higher concentration of oxygen in the lungs, but we're increasing that pressure gradient so that the oxygen is going to want to move across that alveolar capillary membrane much quicker because of the increased pressure gradient. Okay, so that's one. That's the easiest way we can correct hypoxia is we just increase the FiO2. We do that every single day on every single patient that we manage. If they're a little bit hypoxic, we turn up the FiO2. The other way we do that is we increase um, their mean airway pressure. Okay, and respiratory therapists out there, they know this. They know that mean airway pressure is the best indicator of um, oxygen perfusion pressures. Okay, mean airway pressure is the average of the airway pressures at the alveoli across the entire ventilatory cycle. Okay, and the, the quickest way we can increase this mean airway pressure is to add PEEP. Okay. Basically, it takes the baseline and it raises it up. We're increasing the pressure in the airway across the entire respiratory cycle, peeping positive and expiratory pressure. So if we had that patient that we're bagging and we have a peep valve, we can increase the, the dial, we can turn the pressure up uh, on the peep valve so that it's maintaining pressure within the, the pulmonary tree during that exhalation phase, okay? BiPAP or CPAP is that much, it's just that much better. It's PEEP, but to the next level. Okay? It's PEEP over the entire spectrum of uh, respiration. So by increasing the CPAP, we're increasing the pressure across the whole, during the entire ventilatory cycle. Okay, so we've increased the FiO2 and we can increase the PEEP. Remember we talked about Fick's law and how Fick's law says that the rate of gaseous diffusion depends on a number of things. It's one, the concentration gradient. It's two, the, the distance that the, the gas has to move across that semi-permeable membrane. And three, it's the surface area, right? So when we add PEEP, we're increasing the FiO2 because we've already turned the dial up and we are... Um, increasing the surface area by distending those alveoli and keeping them open, keeping them larger. And then we are decreasing the distance that that oxygen has to diffuse across that membrane um, by, again, pushing any fluid, pushing any gunk that might be in the alveoli out and widening, kind of thinning out that membrane. Okay, so that's how we increase oxygenation. Okay, so when we have a patient who is in respiratory distress, right? And we throw a pulse ox on them and their O2 sats are low. We throw, we, we throw a mask on, we turn up the FiO2. If we have that patient is, who is in severe distress and we know that they're hypoxic, their sats are in the 80s, they're plummeting, we throw CPAP on them because we're going to be able to increase their FiO2 and we're going to be able to increase that mean airway pressure, okay? By dialing up the CPAP, we're increasing the pressure across the entire spectrum, okay? So oxygenation problem, CPAP. Well, no, okay, so where does BiPAP come in? And, and what is BiPAP, right? A lot of people write it at B-I-P-A-P. BiPAP, B-I, is actually a trade name. It's, it's actually, um, when you talk about it in general terms or generic terms, it's BPAP um, or bi-level positive airway pressure, but it's just BPAP. Okay? Um, and what that is, is two pressures. There is an inspiratory pressure and there's an expiratory pressure. That expiratory pressure is your CPAP. When you're running BiPAP, it's called EPAP. Okay, and I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of numbers out there, but E or a lot of uh, acronyms out there, but EPAP. EPAP is expiratory positive airway pressure. It is the pressure that the patient gets during the exhalation phase. Now, the inspiratory pressure, or IPAP, that is the higher number. Okay, so when we, when we give somebody BiPAP, we're frequently putting them on like 10 over 5, 15 over 5, okay, 15 over 10, something like that, okay? There's two pressures. That, that top pressure, if, I, if we're given, if we're, say we're putting somebody on, uh, let's just make it easy, 10, 10 over 5, okay? If we're putting somebody on 10 over 5 BiPAP, they're getting an inspiratory pressure of 10 centimeters of water. So when they take a breath in, the ventilator ramps up the pressure and it gives them an additional boost, Okay. And then when they exhale, the, the, the pump in the ventilator ramps down and it maintains five centimeters of pressure during the exhalation phase. Okay. So 
in reality, yes, this is going to increase that mean airway pressure. Um, um, but it's because of the peep. Okay. Um, and we need to have that. We need to keep that in mind. It's that exhalation pressure. Okay. So if you have a patient who has a ventilatory problem, okay, they can't blow off CO2 for whatever reason it might be. Maybe they're a CO2 retainer. They're a COPD patient who's having an acute exacerbation and their CO2s are climbing through the roof. That is a type 2 ventilatory failure or type 2 respiratory failure. It's a failure to ventilate. And those patients need additional support with their ventilation. How do we correct ventilation? Remember back to the rule of twos. And I'm going to put this in here um, eventually. Uh, there's a really great... Um, there's a really great, uh, the episode is in iTunes and I want to link to it here. Um, I'll pull this up while I'm chatting, but um, oh, I can't do it right now, but I'll put it in here. It's episode, I think it's 45A. So if you go to uh, iTunes or you, you, know, you have your podcast and you download um, the Rebel, uh, Rebelcast podcast, it is, uh, I'm looking at this right here, sorry. Um, I don't want to forget about it. It's. Um, 46A, respiratory failures and non-invasive ventilation, or NIV. Um, look that up. It's, it's really great, and they, they talk about this as well. Um, and I'll do an episode of it uh, as well on uh, the Tips from Crypt podcast. Um, so anyways, type 2 ventilation failure. So how do we correct someone's ventilatory problem? There's only two ways. We're back to the rule of two, right? We have two ways to improve oxygenation. There's two types of um, um, uh, respiratory failure. And now we have two types of, uh, two, two ways that we can correct a ventilatory failure. Okay? The first one is increase the respiratory rate. Okay? Uh, it's all about minute ventilation. Okay? So what are the two components of minute ventilation? Minute ventilation is tidal volume and respiratory rate. If you remember that, then you know how to correct a patient's ventilatory problem. We can either increase their respiratory rate or we can increase their tidal volume, okay? So how do we increase a patient's tidal volume um, with a ventilator? If they're, in, if they're in invasive ventilation, then we just increase the tidal volume, right? We need to, of course, make sure that we're doing that safely in a way that we're not exceeding some of those pressures that, um, that reach a dangerous point point. we can cause barrel trauma and volume trauma. Um, but we increase their tidal volume in order to maximize their uh, their ventilation status. Okay. Um, now, generally speaking, based on our net protocol, we know that we should be targeting about eight mLs per kilo. Okay? And uh, you and I, taking a normal breath right now, are capable of of hitting eight mLs per kilo. If we have that patient that we start them on eight mLs per kilo and their airway pressures are through the roof, we cannot ventilate them adequately at eight mLs per kilo. We need to start titrating our our um, our volumes down um, to a point. Okay? And we don't want to cause um, atelectasis um, because that can cause atelectatic trauma to the alveoli when they start collapsing. That's where PEEP comes in to keep those alveoli open. Um, but if we're trying to correct somebody's ventilation status and we've got the respiratory rate within a physiologic norm or you know, we've matched their, uh, their respiratory rate to what they were breathing prior to um, or when we first get, got to them, right? Because we don't want to take somebody who's got an intrinsic rate of 30, put them on a the ventilator or put them on BiPAP um, and just let them simply breathe um, you know, at 20 or, or whatever it might be. You know, that would be bad on the ventilator. Uh, if they're on BiPAP or if they're on CPAP, they're going to breathe at whatever rate they want. How do we increase their volume? Right, because that's what we need to do. These patients who are who are really in distress, they're really uh, tachypnic. They're taking short, shallow, um, fast breaths. Right, so their respiratory rate is up, but their volume is down. We need to give them volume support. Okay, and the way we do that with non-invasive is through BiPAP, and it's that inspiratory pressure that gives them their volume. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Um, where are you normally going to start somebody on uh, volume vo on BiPAP? Probably somewhere in the range of 10 over 5. If you want to do you know, 8 over 3 or 12 over 6 or whatever it might be, whatever you're comfortable with, start them somewhere. Okay, It doesn't really matter because you're going to start 
titrating them up. And you're not going to just walk away from this patient, right? You're there with them. You're going to assist them with the mask. You're going to help them uh, uh, adjust to having the mask on their face. And as the patient is uh, is starting to get more comfortable with the mask, you're going to be, you'll titrate up your inspiratory pressure. Okay. So you got a patient, they're on BiPAP, 10 over 5, and they're still in distress, right? And I, and I got this example from the guys over at um, uh, RebelCast, but it, it really uh, helps illustrate uh, the point. And I've had this exact same thing happen to me. You have a patient, they're in respiratory distress. You put them on BiPAP. You, 10 over 5, and you watch them. And they're sat, you know, they're, they're, their sats are okay, but they're breathing, you know, they're really breathing uh, high, uh, really fast. They're, they're still in distress. Their CO2s are still through the roof. And so what do you do? You, you turn up the BiPAP, right? So maybe now you bump them to, you know, you know 15, over, 15 over 10. And you watch them. And they're not getting any better. So you think, oh my God! So you turn up the you turn up the pressure again. You go to twenty over fifteen. Okay, the sats are still okay, but they're not ventilating better. They're not blowing off that CO two. Okay, and now what you start to see is their blood pressure start to tank. Why? Here's what I want you to realize: there's this thing called the delta P. Okay, the delta P. Um, and what that is, the delta P. Okay. And what that is, that is the difference between the inspiratory pressure and the expiratory pressure. Okay. And it's the delta, it's the difference in the delta P, the difference between those two pressures that gives you your volume. Okay. Imagine this. What I want you to do is sit here and I want you to take a take a breath in. Okay. Take a deep breath in as, as deep as you can. And then you let it out. Okay. Now what I want you to do, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to take a deep breath in and I want you to hold it. And then I want to let you, want you to let that breath halfway out. Okay. So we're going to take a deep breath. Then you're going to let it partially out. And then you're going to try and take a breath in again. You can't move as much volume until you've gotten all of that air out. Okay. And we talk about breath stacking, right? When we're giving a patient peep, and we're going to talk, we're gonna go back to this idea of PEEP and CPAP. When we give somebody PEEP, what are we doing? We're giving them pressure, but we're giving them volume, right? When you fill up those alveoli, you expand them, you put more volume in there, that's how you get more pressure. Well, if you don't let that volume come down a little bit, they don't ever um, you know, exhale, and now you don't have room for more volume, okay? So imagine you have you know, uh, the delta P between 5 and 10 and 20 and 15 is still 5. So now you've got 15 centimeters of PEEP um, or, or EPAP, okay, holding all those alveoli open, and now you deliver, you bump that up 5 more centimeters of, of water to give them their inspiratory pressure. Well, you've only gone up an extra 5, pressure, uh, five centimeters of, of pressure. So there's still very little ventilation. There's still very little air movement, right? Imagine now you have a patient who's on five of PEEP and 25, uh, or, or let me say, say that a different way, five of expiratory pressure and 25 of inspiratory pressure. Well, what's your delta P then? Your delta P is 20. You got 20 centimeters, uh, uh, centimeters of water of driving pressure helping that patient ventilate. So they go from five centimeters all the way up to 25. So you got 20, uh, 20 centimeters of water pressure moving uh, air in and out of their lungs. So that's what's going to give you that increased tidal volume. How are you going to monitor that? How are you going to know what your tidal volumes are? You're going to measure them. The ventilator may not be able to measure inspiratory volumes like you can when you're uh when you have an intubated patient and you're volume ventilating them but it can measure the amount of volume that's coming back out of the patient okay and so you're going to measure your expiratory volumes or your uh, vte and okay? the uh, tidal volume the expiratory tidal volume so what you're going to do you have that patient they have a ventilatory problem and of course like we talked about before um most patients 
are not going to have just a ventilatory um, uh, derangement. They're probably going to have uh, a ventilatory and an oxygenation derangement. So giving them some kind of um, uh, pressure support, or I'm sorry, um, CPAP or expiratory pressure is going to benefit, benefit them also. Um, uh, and then you're going to dial up your inspiratory pressure. You don't need to dial up your expiratory pressure if your patient does not have an oxygenation problem. It's not going to help their ventilation, and it could potentially hinder your ability to increase their ventilatory status and blow off that CO2, okay? Make sure, if you can, serial blood gases, especially if you're doing long transports, to make sure that you're not overshooting. But that's how you're going to manage your patient who's in respiratory failure um, on BiPAP. Type 1 respiratory failure is oxygenation problem. They need PEEP or CPAP. A type 2 respiratory uh, failure is uh, a failure of ventilation. And those patients need um, pressure support or inspiratory pressure on your BiPAP. Now, what about putting a patient on, like, like we, we do, we will sometimes put a patient on, uh, like an intubated patient, put them on pressure control or pressure support, like SIMV pressure support, right? SIMV is going to synchronize the pressure support, gives them a little bit of extra uh, push in order to help them ventilate better. But in a non-invasive mode, um, what if you're like, I don't really know if I'm going to need um, uh, inspiratory pressure or expiratory pressure, which mode do I use do I start in CPAP and then I switch to BiPAP? Well, you can start in BiPAP and just simply set your, um, your inspiratory pressure to zero, set your expiratory pressure to five. Now you're basically running CPAP. And then if now you realize that that patient needs ventilatory support, you just start dialing up your, uh, your inspiratory pressure. Now keep in mind, you need to know how your ventilator works. Most transport ventilators, we use the Revell. I've used the LTV 1200 in the past. Um, those two ventilators are what we call not PEEP compensated. Okay, what does that mean? It means it does not account for the PEEP that you already have um, applied or in, in, in the case, in the setting of uh, BiPAP, the expiratory pressure. It does not account for that, um, that pressure when it, you start applying um, inspiratory pressure. Okay, so it's additive is what I'm really trying to say. If you want 10 of inspiratory pressure and 5 of expiratory pressure, you're going to set your PEEP or your expiratory pressure to 5 and your inspiratory to 5 because together um, those make 10. So it's essentially saying your inspiratory pressure is 5 over whatever your PEEP is. So you can set your expiratory pressure to five. You can set your inspiratory pressure to zero. Now you're just running CPAP, and now you realize the patient needs some ventilatory support. You just start dialing up your uh, inspiratory pressure. As soon as you click it up one, you're adding one to five. So now you have six over five. Okay, you're probably going to want to start at something more like ten over five. So you're going to have five on your inspiratory pressure, five on your expiratory pressure. That's going to give you your ten over five BiPAP settings. I hope that makes sense. Let me. Um, Let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna try one more time to pull up this. Okay, I can't do that. So, um, yeah, just go to uh, wherever you get your podcast. Look up um, Rebel EM and do a search for episode 56A. Uh, it's a good one. Okay. Um, questions. See if anybody's got any questions that pop up. Um, I see that there's three people uh, watching right now. Um, oh, hey, Chris. Oh my goodness, I gotta should have scrolled down. Dave, hello. Hey, thanks for joining. Uh, all good points. Thank you. Seems lots of people are more afraid of BiPAP than RSI. Uh, yeah, I would agree. And, you know, here's the thing about um, ventilators, right? They are a fantastic tool. We need them. They really do help our patients. But we need to be careful with them. We need to know what we're doing because we can really injure our patients, um, just like with RSI, right? You know, uh, in, in RSI, we should all be terrified of because we're basically, you know, well, you know what we're doing. Chris Williams joined. Hey, buddy, how are you? I don't know if you're still watching, but if you are, it's good to see you here. Mr. Charlie Nolan, thanks, buddy, for popping in. Okay, so um, pediatric ventilation. Um, what I really want to say about pediatric ventilation is um, 
couple pointers uh, when it comes to setting up the ventilator for pediatric ventilation. Uh, give me one second. I can't reach what I want. Okay, here we go. Chris, I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad to see you're here, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you are still watching because you're going to appreciate this. If you transport pediatric patients and you put them on the ventilator, you better have one of these in your bag. Okay? What is this? You recognize this? Anesthesia bag or flow inflating bag. Nice thing about this is this little gizmo right here and this little gizmo right here. Okay? An anesthesia bag or a pediatric bag, one, it requires flow, so you need to have adequate oxygen supply. But what this is going to allow you to do is determine or to decide, and I don't have an O2 tank here with me, it's going to help allow you to figure out how much pressure you need to give this patient um, in order to achieve adequate oxygenation and ad adequate ventilation um, before you actually hook them up to the vent. Okay, as you squeeze this bag, the manometer is going to dial up. You want to make sure, right, that you're staying in the yellow between 20 and 40. Uh, if you start exceeding 40, then you start opening up that lower esophageal sphincter and you start putting air into their belly. Um, actually, it's closer to like 23. So staying in green is best. Um, but we do know that when we're when we're ventilating some of these patients who have stiff lungs, we need to give them a little bit more pressure. So by hooking this up. To your flow and by ventilating your pediatric patient with the flow inflating bag you're going to be able to see what your peak inspiratory pressures are which are going to be on the dial here okay this is going to come around and it's going to show you what your peak inspiratory pressures are to ventilate that patient and then if you need to you can dial up your peep right here so with an anesthesia bag or a flow inflating bag you can deliver peep so of course you have your mask um, if you're if you're just bagging them, or if you if they're intubated, you put them on there, and you can dial up your peep slowly to see at what point you're getting adequate recruitment and adequate oxygenation, and then you can see what kind of airway pressures you have. Now, this is just a bridge, right? This gets you to the point where you're ready to put the patient on the ventilator. Okay, uh, and then you're basically just going to set your ventilator up to match whatever pressures you have on your anesthesia bag. The other way to do that is if you're picking a patient up from a um, from a, uh, uh, a hospital and, and respiratory has already been there managing the patient, take a look at what settings they have, but also do your own due diligence. Look at the patient, see how well they're responding to those settings, and don't be afraid to, to make adjustments to them. You might need to call respiratory into the room, get their input. You might need to call the uh, the receiving fellow and get their input. Um, just because they've got the patient dialed, if the patient doesn't look good, you need to start making changes. And it may involve taking them off the ventilator, putting them on the flow inflating bag, and seeing what kind of airway pressures you're getting and then making adjustments. Oh, Dave, you're an RT? Awesome. Are you an RT? I, get to, I have the pleasure of flying uh, with an RT who's also a paramedic. Uh, I don't personally get to work with her, but she, you know, but she does. Uh, she does work for our company, and she, it's outstanding having uh, RTs um, uh, working with us in flights. Okay, so talked about the anesthesia bag. All right, the other thing I want to talk about is um, some of these uh, transport ventilators. Okay, uh, there are a bunch of transport ventilators out there. Um, the Hamilton uh, is one that's pretty popular. I don't know or have any experience with the Hamilton, but what I'm going to talk to you about is the Rebel, which is what I'm currently using, and then the and the LTV is is um, right there with it as well. The Rebel is a great ventilator. Um, it's only rated down to five kilos, um, but between five and ten kilos it doesn't do a, a great job. You can ventilate a, pa a patient with, uh, with the Revell um, uh, with a patient who's somewhere between five and 10 kilos, but um, it doesn't do a great job, okay? So let's think about this for a minute. What is our target tidal volume? Our target tidal volume is eight mLs per kilo. Okay, so what is eight times six, right, 54? The ventilator is, uh, I'm sorry, no, 6, 36, 12, 48. 
48. So uh, we have a patient who is five or six kilos, okay? And um, we're, we're trying to set them up on the ventilator. We know that we want to target eight mLs per kilo, and we know that we have this patient who is um, six kilos, okay? So when I say six, 36, 48, 48 kilos. 48 kilos is our uh, our goal, okay? Six times eight. 48, uh, I'm sorry, 48, uh, 48 mLs, good grief. 48 mLs is our, tar our target tidal volume, okay? So, um, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Joel. I don't know why I'm brain dead today. I'm talking faster than my my brain can can think. Um, so, 48 mLs is our target tidal volume, okay? Well, the Revell will only go to 50 mLs. That is the lowest it will go. So, um, that's one problem. The other problem is, what is your, your normal um, eye time for maybe like a, like a, a five or six kilo kid? Okay. Probably somewhere right around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 maybe. In order to get down to 50 mLs tidal volume on the Ravel, you have to go into infant mode. But in infant mode, the ventilator will, is, is preset at an eye time of 0.3. Well, 0.3 is way too quick of an eye time for most five or six kilo kids, okay? So you dial it up to the pediatric mode. You put it in a pediatric mode. So now your eye time is a 0.7. Great, okay? 0 0.6, 0 0.7, pretty good. But now your, the, the smallest tidal volume that the Ravel will allow you to, to set is 120 mLs per kilo. I'm sorry, 120 mLs, tidal volume. So what do you do? You're stuck. You can't have an adequate eye time if you go in peds mode, and you can't go, uh, you can't have an adequate um, uh, tidal volume uh, if you're in, or I'm sorry, you can't have an adequate eye time if you're in infant mode, and you can't have an adequate tidal volume if you're in peds mode. Not to mention the fact that we really should be a little bit closer to 48 mLs tidal volume or a little bit lower, right? So how do we do that? Point three, Dave, not quite sure. Is that not what I said? Point three, or maybe you were just answering my answering my question. Um, if if you're ventilating your kiddos at point three uh, eye time, um, and you've had good luck with that, great. Our, our respiratory therapists and our, our physician advisors don't like that sort of a of an eye time for um, for that small of a kiddo. Um, so your only option then is to switch into pressure mode. So basically, what we say is with these um, these ventilators that can't do super small volumes and you need to know what your ventilator is capable of anything between five we know that we can't go lower than five kilos because the ventilator is just not allowed uh, not set up for that anything between five and ten um kilo patient we immediately go to pressure support and we start our uh you know uh, like a pressure a pressure ventilation mode and we start with the the uh anesthesia bag we figure out what volume or we figure out what pressures we need and that's where we set our pressures um our uh, our uh, peep and our uh and our inspiratory pressures for our pressure control uh ventilation you have to know how do you, how you're going to troubleshoot because if you just simply expect that you're going to be able to set your vo your ventilator up to deliver the volumes that you anticipate needing and and then you find yourself in a situation where wait a minute i i can't i can't get the numbers that i want i can't go uh i can't get the right tidal volume i can't get the right eye time um you got to know how to make a, a switch on the move and go to pressure and get those numbers dialed in um if you are ventilating that child appropriately you're watching your chest rise and you're paying attention to your numbers, right? Of course, we know that these are, it's not really um, too accurate. I mean, we're kind of guessing if we're at 22 or 23 uh, inspiratory pressure or 25, but at least it gives us a place to start. And then we can start watching our XL tidal volumes, just like we do with BiPAP to see how well um, our patients are responding, how much tidal volume they're getting, watching their uh, pulse ox. If, Remember, what do we do if we need to increase their O2 saturations? We increase their FiO2 or in, we increase their PEEP. And if we, they need more volume, we're going to go up with their rate or we're going to go up with their, um, excuse me, with their inspiratory pressures. And we're going we're to 
trend that by looking at their exploratory um, title volumes. All right. Dave, Joel, thanks guys for hanging in there and helping me out here when my brain was not um, not really engaging there. Questions about what we just talked about. We talked about pediatric ventilation um, with, with our ventilate, ventilators um, and how we're going to get these small tidal volumes. We talked about how we really should be starting with an anesthesia bag before we actually put the patient on the ventilator. So if you don't have these in your kits, you should have one. You should get one. Talk to your uh, supply chain manager. Talk to your respiratory therapist. Make sure that you have these in your bags because any patient, any pediatric patient that you're putting on the ventilator, you should be starting them uh, with these. And these are great. If you have to do a neonatal resuscitation, boom, right there. Right, That's what you want, right? If you've taken MRP, you know that that's what you want. Um, you can dial up your peep. I think this goes all the way up to like 15, I think. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't actually looked at looked at. I probably should. I should know how high that goes. Um, and then, of course, you can you can monitor your um, your inspiratory your peak inspiratory pressures. What else? Anything else? That's like 46 minutes. Got a few other things I um, we could talk about if you guys have any questions. Let me scroll through some of uh, the other questions that I've gotten throughout uh, the last several weeks. Um, I'm pretty excited about um, about Epic, uh, and I talk about all this stuff in the Epic Review course as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be IBSC certified here within the next four to yeah, probably six to eight weeks. I'll, I'll say conservatively, um, could be a little bit quicker. Um, we have revamped the um, cardiology and he, or the hemodynamic section. We've made some um, uh, some improvements to the uh, cardiology section uh, as it pertains to um, 12 leads and Scarbosa criteria. Uh, we have made some updates to uh, the toxicology section and um, with regards to uh, lipid emulsion therapy, if you're not familiar with that. Um, that's going to be in there, uh, using lipid emulsion infusions IV to um, uh, correct a lot of these uh, toxic ingestions. Uh, we talk, uh, we added in a component about which medications can be um, cleared from the system through dialysis. So that's kind of uh, that that's a whole new topic that we wanted to add. Um, Amy, hey, what's up? I'm glad to see you here as well. Amy is like the resident pediatric neonatal uh, queen. She's amazing. Um, Amy, actually, I'm, I'm going to get you on the on the podcast one of these times and we're going to talk pediatrics. I took my first stable class from Amy down in uh, New Mexico. Uh, awesome, awesome provider. Super cool to see you here. Um, what else? Uh, where was I? Uh, what, what else did we add? Let's see. Uh, do, 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 let me pull this up here. Just to kind of give you guys uh, just kind of a background on on what we're what we're doing, um, kind of what we're what we're working on and how this is coming along. Lipid emulsions is what I was just talking about. Um, dialysis. Uh, that's about it. Right? Everything else has been pretty solid um, so far. So uh, if you want to find out more about that, um, you can head over to flightcrit.com and at the top of the page, uh, click courses, and you can see um, some of the courses that we have there. And uh, click on that link for the review course, and you can see kind of what it's all about. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. You guys have anything else you want to talk about? No. All right, guys. Well, hey, share this out if you if you found this helpful. I know that I get a lot of questions about ventilator management, and I try to hit the uh, the topics that seem most beneficial. Uh, you can always um, send me a comment here on Facebook, uh, or you can email me, Sean at flightcrit.com, if you have any specific questions that you want me to address. Uh, once the course is done being reviewed, I am going to ramp back up the podcast. Uh, I'm already starting to outline some of our future shows, so um, that's going to be pretty exciting, tipsfromcrypt.com. Um, and you can also find a link to the podcast on, uh, on the website or at flightcrit.com. Uh, I do love to get questions from listeners. Um, and you guys can send me a question, um, that you want featured on the show. If you go to, um, 
Oh, where is it? Well, if you go to flightcrit.com and you click on the um, tips from crit link at the top and then scroll down the page, you'll see um, a button there that says send me a message. You click on that, you can record a message directly from your phone. I get that um, via email and then I can import that into the podcast. If you take a look at the, um, episode six of the podcast uh, where I talk about rapid 12 lead EKG interpretation, um, that was a listener question. You can kind of see how the format goes. Pretty fun. I love doing those. Um, Thanks, guys, for tuning in and checking this out. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I will put a link to that uh, Rebelcast um, uh, episode uh, in the comment section here in just a little bit. Uh, all right, we'll catch you guys next week. Next week, it will be on Thursday, whatever Thursday is, the 6th maybe. Um, and uh, still trying to figure out what time works best for everybody. So we'll just keep playing around with that. All right, guys, have a good one. See you later.